In the last couple of lectures, we looked at two cryptographic primitives that are used to build what will become the blockchain data structure, which is what's used by Bitcoin and, and other projects. So one's a hash function and one's a digital signature. Now what I want to do is I want to start showing how we use the hash function, how we use the digital signatures to build the bigger data structure, uh, which is called the blockchain. So we know a little bit anyways about how a hash function works, what, it prop what its properties are, and similarly with digital signatures, the details of, of how they work internally isn't that important. Uh, it's more important just to understand what it's actually doing for you, what kind of security properties it has. Um, and then sometimes you care about little small details, uh, but we'll circle back to these, those details as, as we need them. Okay, so what can we do with a hash function or, or where's a hash function actually used in this blockchain data structure? It turns out that it's used in a whole bunch of different places. So hash functions are, are used a lot. Um, so we're going to work towards one application and in order to kind of build up to it, what I want to talk about is something called a commitment scheme. And so a commitment scheme is um, a primitive, or you can think of it as, as a kind of protocol. Usually primitive means only one person's involved a protocol means that there's more than one person involved. And, and so in this case, there is usually more than one person involved. Um, and so to motivate what we need a commitment function for, consider the following scenario. Uh, so let's say we have Alice and we have Bob and they're trying to decide something. Let's say they're trying to decide what restaurant uh, to, to eat at. And so, you know, Alice wants one type of, of food uh, Bob wants a different type of food. So Alice wants to go for Korean barbecue and Bob wants to go for um, for Indian food. So that's fine. So they can't decide and they, they both like each other's kind of restaurants. They just have a preference uh, for, for their own type of restaurant. So what they decide is, okay, uh, let's say they're not together. They're talking over the phone and um, or texting and they uh, are like, okay, we're going to flip a coin. Okay. Now the problem is who's going to flip the coin. So let's say Alice flips her coin. Um, uh, Bob doesn't know whether she actually flipped the coin, right? If, if heads means that we go for Korean barbecue and Alice wants to go for Korean barbecue, then if Alice is entrusted to flip the coin, she'll just say heads, right? And Bob will be like, did you actually flip a coin or did you just say heads because that's what you wanted? And similarly with Bob, right? If Bob, if tails means Indian food and Bob wants Indian food, then uh, he's always going to say tails. Okay, so is there a way that sort of over text uh, you could actually do a kind of coin flip? Uh, and um, so, so the idea here is that actually what we're going to have is we're going to have both of them flip a coin. So let's say Alice flips a coin and Bob flips a coin uh, and they both report what their flip is. And then what we can do is we can combine those two flips into the equivalent of a single flip, right? So for example, if it's heads, heads, we might map that to heads, tails, tails, we could map to heads. So if it's the same, if they both flip the same way, um, then we consider a heads. And if they flip differently, tails, heads, heads, tails, we map that to tails. Okay. And in fact, just to get rid of this second level of indirection, we can just um, map this directly. So if, if they do heads, heads, we'll do what Alice wants. Tails, tails, we'll do what Alice wants. Tails heads will do what Bob wants and heads tails will do what Bob wants. Okay. And we'll say that this is Alice's flip and this is tails. This is Bob's flip. Okay. So this is great. Um, so Alice could flip her head, her, her coin and let's say that she says it's heads. Okay. So if it's heads, notice that, that we still don't know whether Alice or Bob will, will get chosen. Right. So, so it, it is possible if Alice flips ahead that she'll get her choice. And it's also possible that Bob will get his choice. So it seems kind of fair probabilistically. And if Bob truly flips a coin, then with 50% probability, they'll do what Alice wants. And with 50% probability, they'll do what Bob wants. Okay. The only problem with this protocol is that if Alice tells Bob, Hey, I flipped a head, right. Then Bob can lie about his coin and he can say, well, I flipped a tail, right? So if he learns first what Alice flips, then he knows how to flip his coin, or rather how to not flip his coin and pretend to flip it so that he gets the outcome that he wants, okay? If Bob doesn't know what Alice's flip is, then he doesn't care, right? If he says heads, he could end up doing what Alice wants or what Bob wants, 
right, depending on Alice's flip. Similarly, if Bob decides, I'm just going to say tails, I'm not actually going to flip my coin, he, similarly, he could end up doing one of the two, okay? Um, and so anyways, you can look at this little chart and you can convince yourself that uh, if both of them flip honestly, or at least if they, even if they don't flip honestly, they're just going to choose heads or tails arbitrarily, um, there's no way to game the system uh, unless if they know what the other person flipped. Okay, so if there are a way that they could both flip at exactly the same time, or at least report what they flipped, whether they're making that flip up or if they're actually flipping a coin, if they were, could report it at exactly the same time, so neither of them had that time advantage of seeing what the other person's flipped and then being able to adapt uh, their flip to what the other person flipped, this would be a fair protocol, okay? So what we need really is we need a way to, um, we need a way for them to um, sort of synchronize in time, okay? So we might literally try and do that. We might be like, okay, we're going to do a countdown three, two, one, and then we'll both send it at the same time. So if you think about a similar problem to this is rock, paper, scissors, right? If I, this, this is this game, and if I see uh, whether you did rock, paper, or scissors first, and I can react quickly, I can always beat you, okay? And so there's always this sort of countdown before you do it. Um, anyways, if you don't know about the game Rock, Paper, Scissors, it doesn't matter. It's just another another thing for those of you who know that, that game to, to think about what's going to happen here, okay? Um, now, perfect synchron synchronicity, that's not possible, okay, generally speaking. Um, so what we can do instead is we can do a commitment scheme. So in a commitment scheme, what we're going to do is um, Alice is going to pick a coin flip, okay? And what she's going to do is, she's going to broadcast it to Bob, but she's going to do it in two stages. She's going to broadcast it to Bob where she's made her decision, but it's sort of hidden. It's kind of, you know, Bob doesn't know what it is, okay? But once she tells Bob the hidden version of what she did, then um, she can't change it. Okay, so for example, let's let's actually before we think about cryptography, let's just think about sort of paper and pencils and, and the physical world. So let's say that if Alice, you know, she chose heads and she kind of like put it in an envelope, right? And she gave that envelope to Bob, or maybe they both put the envelope on the table, and then Bob did the same thing. So he flipped a coin, and let's say he happens to choose uh, heads as well and he has this in a sealed envelope. When the envelopes are sitting there, they can't change them, okay? So they're, they're, uh, they don't know when Bob, because Bob goes second, he doesn't know what Alice did, okay? So he doesn't know that Alice chose heads, but because he has at least that decision inside an envelope, Alice can't change it either, okay? So it's in this state where it's locked in, but not revealed, okay? Um, and so that's what an envelope does. It gives you a message uh, that's locked in but not revealed. Okay. Then after, what they can do is they can sort of open the envelopes. Okay. So Alice will will open the envelope. Bob will open his envelope, and then they can both see that the outcome of this was heads heads. Therefore, they're going for Korean barbecue because that's what Alice wanted. Okay. All right. So this idea of of a, an envelope is is a nice. Um, it's a nice kind of primitive. It would be cool if we could do this in a digital sense, right? Could we create a kind of digital envelope that behaved this way, where we could take a message that was digital, we could put it in an envelope where it's sort of locked in, but we haven't revealed it yet. And then later, we have some mechanism or algorithm to sort of open the envelope up, okay? So a commitment scheme is exactly that. It's meant to be the digital equivalent. So in general, what we're going to do is we're going to have a function, we can call it commit. And uh, I'm going to tweak this in a second, but let's assume for now we just put a message in. 
uh, what we're going to get out is a commitment scheme, or sorry, a commitment to that message. So, so that that message in an envelope, if you will. So we'll call that C for a commitment, uh, and then later we're going to have a reveal. And we can prove that uh, this commitment produces this message. Okay, um, so this is a commitment scheme. And this function, we often say this idea of it locked in but not revealed, uh, there's usually more formal terms that we use. Uh, so we say that it's binding, meaning that once you commit to message M, you cannot reveal. So if C is a commitment to message M, you cannot reveal a different message than M. So you can't have this reveal on the C produce M prime, where M prime is not M. Okay, so binding means that um, if C is the commit of M, then infeasible to reveal some M prime where M prime is not the same as M. Okay, so that's that's fine. Uh, the other property we have is uh, we want this envelope to actually hide M. So you shouldn't be able to look at C and figure out what M is. So we call this the hiding property. And so at a first glance, we might say it's infeasible to learn what the value M is if we're just looking at C. Um, what we want to do is we want to strengthen it because like, let's say you can just get a bit of M, like the first digit of M or something like that. That's still considered a break. And in a lot of protocols, that's, that's not sufficient. So um, we'll say it's infeasible to learn any information about M. Okay, so this is a, a sort of commitment scheme. Now, the commitment scheme itself, there's, there's two things that, this is too simple uh, for two reasons. Um, the first reason is if we want this commitment scheme to be hiding, um, what might happen is I might have a guess. Like imagine you have a voting system and everyone's voting yes or no, and you're going to vote by publishing a commitment to your vote. Okay, why you would do this, I'm not sure, but let's just pretend that, that this made sense in the context of some greater voting system. Um, so a bunch of people commit to yes and a bunch of people commit to no, and they're, they're free to reveal these C values because you know it's a hiding commitment. You can't tell how I voted, okay? The problem is that all the yes commitments will come out to one value and all the no commitments will come out to another value. And you yourself, you could commit to yes and see what that value is you could then commit to no, and you could see what that value is, and then you actually know how everyone voted, okay? So what we really want is we want commit to be a kind of random function, okay? So we want, uh, every time you commit to the same message, we want a different commitment to come out. Um, so most commitment schemes work that way, so we'll add a, a sort of random factor uh, to it as well. The second thing is the reveal stage, um, if, Anybody can run reveal on C, right? Let's say Alice makes this commitment to some message M. If Bob can run reveal, well, then it doesn't hide that message, right? Because, you know, what's the point of, it, it's not a hiding message if anybody can open it up, right? And so this is where it kind of breaks down in terms of the envelope. If I put something in an envelope, anybody can open that envelope, okay? But in a commitment scheme, in the digital equivalent, only the person who makes the commitment should be able to open it. Okay, and so then we have this problem of there must be some sort of secret, right? There's got to be some secret there because, you know, what, what is it that, that allows Alice to open this commitment but not Bob, right? And so Alice must know something that Bob didn't know. Therefore, Alice has some secret that Bob doesn't have. Therefore, whatever that secret is, it has to be used in creating the commitment, 
Okay, and so it turns out that this randomness uh, we can also use as the kind of secret to reveal the commitment. So when you commit to a message, you choose some random factor and it's kind of like a key. You remember what that randomness is and then later when you want to reveal it, um, you, you use that randomness to reveal it, okay? And the randomness, or sorry, the reveal function looks a little different. It actually looks more like a signature where instead of it being taking as input what the commitment is and returning the message itself, what it's actually going to do is it's going to take the commitment, your assertion as to what the message is, and the randomness, uh, which is your kind of secret key, and then it's just going to say true or false. True, that is a commitment to this message using this randomness, or false. If you, use, if you commit to this message using this randomness, then you end up with a different value, okay? And the way reveal works, in most cases, it depends on the commitment scheme, but in almost all cases, what you do is, because you have these three values, you just rerun this yourself. So you take M and R, you put it through commit yourself and make sure that you get the same C that comes out the other end. Okay, so reveal is not that complicated. You basically just redo the commitment. I'm telling you all the inputs that I use to, to make this commitment. You just redo it and make sure that it actually matches. Um, okay, so if we go back to Alice and Bob uh, trying to flip a coin, uh, basically what's going to happen is Alice will commit to say heads. So we'll call this C A for Alice's commitment. And she's going to use some randomness. We'll call it randomness A. And then Bob is going to commit. Say he picks heads as well. And his randomness will be Bob's randomness. OK. And so at this stage, both parties are locked in. They can't change what their flips are. OK. All right, so, so the outcome of the restaurant has been decided at this point in the protocol. It's just they don't know what it is yet because they have to open these envelopes up, okay? And then to open it, uh, what they'll do is they'll just, they just have to send, uh, Alice will say, oh, I actually chose heads. And then uh, here's the randomness that I used. And Bob will say, well, I chose heads too. And here's the randomness, okay? And even though Alice reveals first, it's too late for Bob. He can't change this to a tails because he can't find, um, he can't decommit CB to tails. Okay. In other words, there is he could there is another combination of these two numbers. Uh, so there is uh, some other commitment to tails using a totally different randomness that would come out to the same value. But for whatever reason, the way the commitment is designed, I'll show you exactly how it's designed, it's going to be hard to find what that randomness is. That's kind of the security property. If that's uh, too, too nuanced, uh, don't worry too much about it. Um, and also notice that it doesn't matter which order they reveal in, okay? Uh, so Bob could go first or Alice could go first. It, there's no advantage to going first. Now there is one attack that this doesn't take care of, which is that when Alice sends heads to Bob, Bob knows, okay, Alice chose heads, he also knows that uh, he's committed to heads and he has no way of opening his commitment up to tails. So as soon as Alice sends him heads and he checks that that commitment is right, he knows the outcome, right? He knows we're going to Alice's restaurant. Alice doesn't know, right? She hasn't seen Bob open his up. So what Bob might do is just stop responding at that point. He might abort the protocol and just walk away. Um, and so in the restaurant case, you know, the consequences of that aren't that severe, but there are cases online where uh, once you open up your commitment and other people see that the cards aren't kind of following the way that they want, they'll just walk away from the protocol. Okay, so this uh, simple scheme does not prevent that attack. There are other ways of, of mitigating that attack, but, but we're getting really sort of far off uh, if, if we start thinking about those. Okay, so this is the example. Okay, now the other thing I'll note is that sometimes um, you don't need both properties of the commitment scheme. So I'll call these half commitments. And in particular, uh, so this is the case uh, exactly where a commitment function is used in blockchain and Bitcoin, where actually what you care about is the binding property. Okay, you want binding. But the hiding property you don't care about. So 
why don't you care about the hiding property? Because this is all going to be public data. So you're going to do a bunch of commitments to data that's already public. And so we don't really care about hiding what that data is. But what we want to do is we want to use the commitment to lock in those that data. So once we publish that data, we can't go back and change our minds about what that data is. OK, and so Bitcoin does a kind of half com or the property they need is they need binding. They don't really need hiding. The way they implement their commitment function actually would give them both. So it, it happens to be both hiding and binding. Um, but the hiding is, is just not used. It's not necessary. OK, so how can we build a commitment function? Uh, so it turns out that there's lots of different ways. Uh, there's a way that you can do it uh, based on a hash function. Um, technically, so I'll say commitments uh, from hashes. There have been some papers on the security side that show that actually this is not sufficient. So this, um, for, for really weird reasons, um, the, the basically, I, oh, I can tell you simply, um, the hiding property of the commitment uh, and the property that you need from a hash function that seems like it's giving you hiding, which turns out to be pre-image resistance, it turns out that those two definitions don't gel exactly. There's, there's, there's a little trouble between uh, assuming that if something's hiding, therefore it's pre-image resistant and vice versa. And so anyways, that doesn't really matter. But, but theoretically, this is not, it hasn't been proven. It's hard to prove that this is a secure commitment function. But this is one of the things where cryptographers do things that seem secure. It seems good enough and it doesn't break in practice. And lots and lots of people do commitments this way. So. Uh, we're just going to assume that this is a secure commitment function, even though theoretically you can't get a security proof to go through uh, for it. Um, so what we're going to do is very simply is we're just going to hash the message and we'll throw some randomness in as well. OK, so we have a hash function. Uh, we have our, our message, so the heads or the tails or whatever the data is, uh, and then we have some randomness. that we use, okay? Um, and so is this a hiding and binding commitment? So let's say you're committing to either heads or tails, okay? Um, so what I do is I choose a random number and then I commit to either heads or tails. If this random factor is big enough, you're not gonna be able to guess it. Uh, so, so we have to make sure that this factor is greater than um, the size of our, it's bigger than two to the um, 112 or whatever NIST says. Um, Uh, so, so sorry, sorry. Uh, let me. Let me denote this correctly. Uh, so it's greater than one twelve bits because we're talking about the length. Okay, or the the actual R itself is bigger than two to the one twelve. Um, so the length of R is is greater than one hundred twelve bits. Okay, then it's going to be a hiding uh, commitment function. Okay, because. This thing is pre-image resistant. That's the argument. So if I could look at C and figure out whether this is heads or tails, it's kind of like the same as looking at the output of a hash, the image, and figuring out what the pre-image is that went in to create that image. Okay. So the hiding property and the pre-image resistant property uh, end up kind of resulting in the same thing. And that's what I was trying to say before is, is theoretically they're not exactly the same and there's some red tape around that. but. Uh, at a high level, um, that's that's the argument. Um, so this is hiding um, because basically breaking uh, the hiding property uh, also breaks pre-image resistance. Okay, it's also a binding commitment. Uh, why is it binding? Well, binding, remember, means that I can open this up. Um, so once I produce the hash, so let's say I hash one message with some randomness, can I find a different message in a different set of randomness so that it produces the same commitment that comes out the same? Okay. And what I've done there is, uh, in, in high probability anyways, I've, I've, uh, I've um, found a collision. Okay. So I found two different things 
uh, that hash uh, to the same value. Okay, so if I could break binding, then I could break, I did it via uh, breaking collision resistance. Okay, so if a hash function is collision resistant, then it's also hiding. Okay, now there is, I'll, I'll just note that when you use this type of commitment, there is a cheap kind of attack on binding, which is at some point this message ends and the randomness starts. Okay, so there's some, and, and when you look at this, I have this comma here, but this comma really means concatenation. So uh, you have a message and then you concatenate some randomness on the end. And if you don't know where, when the message stops and when the randomness begins, for example, let's say the person who's opening the commitment is telling you that, right? They're saying, well, I use 128 bits of randomness and you know this is my message. Then what an attacker could do is they could change, uh, they could say, well, actually I use 256 bits of randomness, okay? Which means some of the message is now being considered random and the message itself is becoming uh, a prefix of the original message. So it's becoming a shorter version. It's, it's becoming a, a different message with the end chopped off because the end is being considered randomness. Um, so in that case, technically, you're finding two different commitments uh, to two different, sorry, the same commitment to two different messages because you're just changing where the message stops and where the randomness begins, okay? Uh, but anyways, a, a very simple solution is just to say that randomness is always this size. So you have a fixed size for the randomness. And if you happen to choose a random number that's smaller, like say, uh, like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is a perfectly fine random number. I mean, the probability of choosing that is very low, but it, it is fine. Then you'll just keep the leading zeros uh, on it. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just note that. Okay, so it requires clear delineation between the end of message and start of randomness. Okay, another kind of low-level detail is, you might say, well, let's just put the randomness at the first. So what if we do randomness and then message? Does order actually matter? And so we did not talk about this at all. I don't want to go into those details, but hash functions do have this problem of what's called a length extension attack, where order of things do matter. Um, so the randomness here is actually specifically here for a specific reason. Uh, there's a reason that, that we want to have the randomness at the end. Uh, but that, anyways, that's a, that's a finesse that we don't, we're not really going to care about. Okay, so in Bitcoin, as I mentioned, we only really need this sort of half commitment. And so it actually turns out that if you don't include randomness at all, uh, this may not be hiding because if there's only one of two values, like this is either heads or tails, then I can just hash both of them and see which one matches. So this, this is not going to be a hiding commitment, uh, unless if your message space is so big that you can't exhaustively search it. Um, so for a half commitment that looks like this, a much simpler commitment, it's not going to be hiding, uh, but it's still binding. Okay, There's still no way that you're going to find a different thing that hashes to the same value because that's a direct break on collision resistance, okay? Um, so this is still binding. Okay, so in Bitcoin, uh, commitments or this idea of committing to data, it shows up more than once. There's a, there's a few different places that it shows up. Primarily, there's two places. So in one place, it's looking like this, where uh, what you're committing to is, is only binding, it's not hiding, there's no random factors, uh, you're just doing straight hashes, but the data structure that you're aggregating these hashes in is, is a little more complicated than this. Uh, so that's what we'll talk about next. And then there's a second place that, that uh, it's used where uh, you do use a, a kind of a random commitment. Um, so, so we'll see both of these used in different spots of the blockchain. Okay. So the next topic uh, we'll talk about related, directly related, is uh, what we call accumulators, which is uh, 
there's different ways of describing this, but for the purposes of this, I'm going to simplify it and just say that it's a commitment to multiple messages. Okay, so let's say I have like four messages. And my goal is to commit to all four of them. How am I going to do it? Okay, and this may sound like a, a kind of stupid question to even ask, um, but uh, let's let's think about let's think about it for a second. Uh, so the the easiest, maybe the most trivial way of doing it is you just commit to each of them individually. Okay, so you would uh, have the hash. Well, I'll just do a a, a binding commitment, a half commitment. Um, so we have the hash of M1, we have a hash of M2, we have a hash of M3, we have the hash of M4. Okay. And so uh, so this is one way of doing it. I, let's not analyze it, but let me just give you straight away a, a second alternative and then we'll talk about what the differences are between it. Another thing you might do is, what if you just concatenate these all together and then just take a commitment of the whole thing? So you hash M1, M2, M3, and M4. And I'll note that the comma here means concatenation. So there's a different notation sometimes that we use, which is the double bar. So um, you can convert it as you want. Okay, so these are two different ways of, of basically doing exactly the same thing, which is committing to four sets of data. Um, so which one's better, or what are, what are the differences between them? Um, so first off, note the, the length is different. Okay, so this is going to be uh, four times the output of our hash function. We'll assume we're using SHA-256, uh, so this is going to be four times 256. Okay, this is a single hash, uh, so it's only 256 bits. Okay, and then specifically as this grows, imagine you're hashing 100 things, right? This is always 256 bits. It doesn't matter if it's 1, 2, 4, 10, 100. Uh, here, it's going to grow linearly in the number of things that you're hashing, okay? Uh, so that's the more important thing is to think what we say asymptotically about it. So this is linear in inputs. And this is constant. in inputs. Okay, so we can do, let's just do a little chart here. So we have one and two. And uh, we might ask ourselves, okay, um, commitment size. Uh, so in one, it's going to be N times 256. And here it's just going to be 256. Okay. Um, okay, so so we're always going to use number two, right? There's there's no possible reason why we might use number one, right? That should be your thinking. Um, but it turns out that, you know, and this is true in, in all kinds of data structures where, uh, as the economists say, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. And so depending on what you want to do with the data, there's usually different data structures that help you do what you want to do. So for example, let's say that Later, remember a commitment is you're committing to reveal later. Okay, you're committing to this data because later you want to reveal it. Um, so let's say we're let's fast forward to the reveal step. So now you want to reveal to me that this is actually a commitment to these four messages. Okay, uh, and so it turns out that that's fine. In order to reveal either of these, they both look kind of the same. Uh, the first one might take a uh, you know there's a little more data that I have to contend with, but other than that, they they look essentially the same. But imagine that, for example, message one, two, three, and four are important to different people. So Alice cares about message one, Bob cares about message two, I care about message three, and you care about message four, okay? If this is being opened up to me, right, I don't need to know M1, M2, and M4 to satisfy myself. I just care that M3 better be what I expect it to be. Okay, so imagine that you want to selectively show that something is committed to. So you want to prove to me that that whatever you did at this commitment stage, you got M3 right. So M3 is actually locked in. Uh, 
I don't care about M1, 2, or 4. Then if we look at these two things, uh, if we use the first approach, all I need to do is I need to get this third value from you. I don't even need a commitment to all four values. I just need the commitment to the one value. And then you just have to tell me what the M3 is and, and if applicable, what the randomness is uh, that you use to create this. And then I can check and say, yes, that matches, okay? So I don't need to ever learn what the original M1, 2, or M4 are in order to verify that this multi-commitment or this accumulation does actually commit properly to M3. Here, if I only know M3 and I want to verify that this is a is actually the hash of M1, M2, M3, and M4, there's, there's nothing I can do unless if I know M1, M2, and M4. So you're going to have to send me all four messages. Then I'll take all four of them, I'll hash them together and make sure that it comes out to whatever this commitment is. Okay, so um, let me just clarify this. So this produces a value. So we'll, we'll call this set of values C1 for commitment style one, and we'll call this uh, C2. Okay, and then this, um, this size is actually a statement on how big this is. Okay, so let's put this in our chart. Um, uh, let's say I want to do a selective opening. Selective reveal. Uh, in the first case, I only need one message. Uh, so I only need one message uh, in order to do it. And in the second case, I need all of the messages. So I need N. Uh, so these are the, the uh, messages that are required. Okay. So this one is bigger, but I can do a selective reveal. And this one's smaller. It's more succinct. But in order to reveal, to do this sort of selective reveal, uh, I need to know all of the messages, okay? So that's the basic trade-off. Other than that, they work exactly the same. So let's say that I implemented Bitcoin and I decided to use one instead of using two. Does it matter at the end of the day? It doesn't matter. It just matters for efficiency, right? It's not going to break any of the properties or change any of the properties, okay? Um, okay, now it turns out that there's actually a third way of doing it, okay? There's a third way, which is once we see these two, we see that... Um, maybe there is a third kind of option that's going to kind of give us the best of both worlds, right? Maybe there's something that's not as big as this. Maybe it's a little bigger than this, but selective reveal, maybe it costs a little more than this, but it costs a lot less than this, right? Is there some sort of middle road where we can trade off the size of, of the commitment for the ability to do a selective reveal, okay? And so it turns out that there's actually probably a million ways of doing it uh, for every data structure that you can think of. I'm sure there's there's um, there's going to be some way of doing it. Um, but uh, there's one way that's that's actually used that's quite common, which is instead of aggregating these uh, either individually or in a sequence, what we're going to do is we're going to put them in a tree. Okay, so we're going to use a binary tree. It doesn't have to be binary. That's just the sort of base case that's used a lot. And uh, this goes by two names. So the person who originally proposed this, uh, his name was Ralph Merkel. He's a cryptographer, did some other stuff. Uh, so these are often called Merkel trees. Uh, sometimes they're just simply called hash trees. Okay, so you might see it. Uh, in these types of names. And I want to emphasize because the Merkle tree gets kind of complicated and sometimes students get confused by it and they think it's, it's really important to understand the Merkle tree. It's not important at all, okay? If your mental model of how Bitcoin works, you'll see where this Merkle tree shows up. But if you have this mental model, like the only difference between your incorrect mental model and exactly how Bitcoin works is, is only a question of efficiency, okay? So this is going to end up being a little more efficient than one of these two approaches. Um, but, but other than that, like it doesn't change anything in terms of, of how it actually functions, okay? So in a binary tree, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take our four messages and we're going to put them kind of like leaves uh, in a tree. So we're going to organize them along the bottom of the tree. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hash them.
okay? And if we just stopped here and I just sent you these four hash values, that's exactly attempt one, okay? So, so far, this is exactly attempt one. Attempt two is that we sort of combine them, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a mix of one and two. So uh, this, this bottom part of the tree is, is actually just attempt one. So this is basically approach of one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the idea of attempt two also uh, to, to try and do things. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these two hashes and we're going to hash them together, okay? So it's going to be the hash of this value and the hash of the second value. And I'm just going to give this a name, otherwise it's going to get too hard to write out. And then similarly, we're going to hash these two together. And then we're going to do the same. We're going to go up a level. So we're going to hash these two things together. Okay. And, and then that's it. Uh, because we have four elements, we quickly get to the top of the tree. If we had more elements than, than four, uh, then it might take us a little longer uh, to get to the tree itself. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to buy some space here. And let's think about how this com performs compared to attempt one and two. Okay, so we can think in terms of our chart here. So we'll add something for three. So the two things that we're considering, one is, the first one is the size, okay? So what I'm gonna claim for you is um, this value, this final value, notice it's the hash of these two values and these values are the hashes of these values and these values are the hashes of all the messages. In other words, all of these messages, all four of them end up inside this top hash somehow, okay? They're all, they all eventually, it's sort of a complicated data structure to get there, but they're all inside this hash in some sense, okay? So we can say that the commitment value, the value that we actually send, is just this value. I'm only going to send you this root value. I'm not going to send you any other information about the tree, okay? Um, this is the output of one hash, okay? Uh, so we call this a Merkle root, or just a root. I'll call it Merkle root. And this is the commitment value. It's the output of one hash. It's a hash of hashes of hashes, but at the end of the day, it goes through one final hash value. So the output size of this is going to be 256 bits. It doesn't matter how big the tree gets, uh, you're always going to hash it down to a single value. So the root will, you'll eventually get to the top of the tree, that's going to be the output of a single hash. Uh, and so this like, uh, attempt number two is going to be only 256 bits. Okay, so these are the things that we like. So we like attempt two because it's only 256 bits as opposed to n times 256 bits. And so the Merkle tree is, is kind of like the winner. Okay, and then here, what we didn't like about attempt two is that the selective reveal, we had to look at n elements. Uh, for this one, we only had to look at one. Okay, so what would be really great is if I could write the number one in here, right? Then it's literally the best of both worlds, right? I get the small size of two and I get the, the small complexity of revealing of one. Okay, that would, be, that would be the ideal scenario. It turns out that we can't quite get it down to one. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get it down to what we call a logarithm. So we're going to get it down to log n, okay? And uh, log n sounds kind of complicated. I'll, I'll motivate where that comes from. Um, but just to remind everyone, if you think of kind of like a number line, and so here's one and here's n, and log n is going to be on this line somewhere. So it's smaller than n, but it's bigger than one. And the question is, where is it? Is it kind of like in the middle? Is that kind of where it is? Um, if we think of this as uh, we can think of this actually as n to the power of one, and we can think of this as n to the power of zero. 
then it's obvious that the halfway line is actually n to the one half, okay? And that's root n, okay? Root n, sometimes you have to remind yourself the difference between a logarithm and a root, but anyways, uh, this would be like kind of root n, so it would be halfway uh, in between. It turns out that log n is like way over here, like it's really close to being constant uh, as opposed to linear, okay? And so log n is, is it's almost linear, but not quite. Okay, so it's really good. Uh, if you can take n and reduce it down to log n in any kind of complexity analysis for any type of data structure, then you've done yourself a big service. Okay, where does the log n come from? Uh, so what's going to happen is, let's say I'm interested in message three. Okay, so message three is, is uh, the message that I want. So what I'm going to do is if I want to prove to you that this is a commitment to message three, this is what I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you message three. Once you have message three, you can compute the hash of message three. Okay, so you can confirm, you can compute what this value should be. Okay, I'm also going to give you, I'm not going to give you M4 itself. I'll just give you the hash of M4. Okay, so I give you the hash of M4. Once you have the hash of these two, you can hash these two values together. And you can see that, oh yeah, that matches this particular value here. So you can see that this value is correct, okay? All right, and then what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that this is actually the B that's in here, but in order to do that, you have to know what the A value is, okay? You don't have to know the whole tree, right? You don't have to know M1 and M2 and the hash of M1 and the hash of M2. You only have to know the actual hash uh, that comes out of here. Then you have enough uh, to compute this value and see that this value matches, okay? So in other words, uh, if I want to prove M3, what I'm doing is I'm giving you what's called a path, a Merkle path. So I'm giving you all the values that are along the path from the root down to the leaf that I'm opening up. And then in addition to the path, I'm also giving you a couple neighbors to the path, okay? And, and so anyways, this thing turns out to be logarithm n. You can stare at it, or if, if you're very comfortable with binary trees, it's, it's probably obvious to you that this ends up being log n. But basically, I'm going to show you uh, log n elements uh, to prove to you that m3 is included in this aggregate Merkle root.